So we're going to start by getting an intuitive picture and imagining what orbitals might be available on carbon and oxygen in order to form bonds. We'll start with the atomic orbitals on carbon. So let's think about the valence orbitals that might be available for bonding. In that case, it's going to be the 2s and 2p orbitals. So in the column where it says carbon atomic orbitals, let's draw those. The s orbital is going to be shaped like a sphere. So it's going to be centered on the xyz coordinates. The next orbital is going to be, we're going to look at the px orbital. So the px orbital has two lobes and it runs along the x-axis. One of those lobes is shaded to show the opposite sign of the wave function. For the py orbital, that one is along the y-axis, which is coming in and out of the screen toward us. And then the pz orbital is along the bonding axis, the z-axis. Once again, it's partially shaded to show the difference in the sine of the wave function. Okay, so we see here that the z-axis is the uh, bonding axis, it's, so it's sideways compared to how we might normally write it to show that it's going to connect with the oxygens. So let's think about the possible combinations for the oxygen group orbitals. So there are eight possible combinations that we need to think about because we have four valence orbitals on each of the two oxygens. Now we're going to think about a pair of the same valence orbital at a time because the two oxygens are equivalent. So first, let's think about a, a group, a combination of S orbitals. So in that case, if oxygen is on the side and then you see the carbon in the middle, then this would be a group of oxygen orbitals that are symmetrical. Now, we could also have the group of oxygen orbitals where one is unshaded and one is shaded, showing the opposite signs of the wave function. And you might say, well, you could also have the combination where both are shaded. And that's true, but that one is basically equivalent to where they're both unshaded. The point is that there's one combination where they're the same and one combination where they're different. Kind of like the linear combinations where we have to consider both the plus combination and the minus combination. Okay, we can do that same exercise for the px orbitals. So we can have two px orbitals on oxygen. And we can either have the combination where they're pointed the same direction, or we can have the combination where they're pointed in opposite directions. Do you see where the, the lobes are just are, are flipped and pointed in the opposite way? Okay, so we can do the same thing with Py. both the combination where they're pointed in the same direction and the combination where they're pointed in opposite directions. And finally, we can do that with PZ. Okay, so once we've drawn all of these possible combinations, our next task is to think about how they could possibly uh, combine with the, um, the carbon atomic orbitals. Okay, so we have all of these, all of these possibilities. And um, I might label these to help us think through which ones could go together. Okay, so if we look at orbital group orbital one, we've got orbitals on oxygen and we're trying to think about which orbitals on carbon could fit in that space. So I think we could put the S orbital on carbon in this middle space here, and it would overlap with orbitals on both oxygens. Um, I could make a bonding combination if 
my center orbital were unshaded, I could also imagine making an anti-bonding combination if my center orbital were shaded. So, I can list that the atomic, the s orbital could make a combination with atomic orbital 1. If I look at atomic orbital 2, I see that I could put the, uh, the px orbital in that center spot and make a bonding combination. I could also imagine putting it in the center spot but flipping the sign so that the lobes pointed the opposite direction so that the, the shaded part was on the bottom and I could make an antibonding combination. So or group orbital 2 has the, has the same symmetry to match up with the px orbital on carbon. Group orbital 3 can make bonding and antibonding combinations with the py orbital. And then if I look at the pz orbital on carbon, um, I can put it here in orbital 4. And look, I can either make a bonding combination or I can make an antibonding combination, depending on how I orient the shading. Okay, but we've kind of neglected um, orbitals 5, 6, 7, and 8, so let's go back to those. If I look at group orbital 5, um, I, let's see, I can't put an s orbital there, but you know what? I could put a pc orbital in group 5, and look, I, if I orient the shading right, I can make a bonding combination. If I look at group orbital 6, let's see, I can't put an s orbital because the s orbital would overlap both with the unshaded and the shaded parts of the orbitals on both sides, so that's not going to work. Um, I can't put the px orbital like I did for orbital 2 because, once again, it, it, it constructive overlap on this side, but any constructive overlap is counterbalanced by destructive overlap on that side, so that one's not going to work. Um, I can't put a py because it's coming out toward us um, orthogonal. And I can't really put a pz because it has the same problem. So none of the atomic orbitals that I have could match up with orbital 6. And we find the same thing with orbital 7, where none of the atomic orbitals can match up with that. Finally, we can look at orbital 8. And we see that um, we can't put pz in there like orbital 4, but we could put an s orbital. And we could make either a bonding or an antibonding combination with the s orbital. 